Um, the protests in America that have been going on acutely for some time, uh, you probably have known about the take a knee from one of the great sport uh, personalities who, who was protesting uh, black aggression or in fact abuse and, and physical abuse. Uh, that created a great stir internationally. Um, we now have Take Two Knees, which is, I think, an even more reverent and beautiful musical gesture started by, by Anthony McGill, but he can explain all of that. Tonight's program is not political, apropos. Tonight's program is born out of what every intelligent artist that I respect deeply, starting with Wynton Marsalis, and these two people with us today have said, we have tried to answer the questions or guess the answers to the questions of unrest and racial inequality, rather than listening to the heartbeat of why it's there in the first place. It's time to listen. And tonight we're going to listen to two of the most extraordinary American artists. And we're gonna start with the bizarre fact of life that when one speaks of this, oh yes, the, oh yes, the African-American Point, 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 point. And Julie and I were just talking about even this word race. Now, I want to preface everybody. We're going to go in essentially three phases. I want the two of them to take you through their, their early development as, as young people in America. And then we're going to explore them much more in depth as artists that they are and what they're currently working on and many things that they've written and, and programmed. And hopefully we'll end the discussion with us all realizing that arts not only belong at the table of all discussions of our society, but in fact, it may be the very table that the other discipline should come to. But we'll get to that. Julia, talk to me about my use of the word race or racism. We even talked about the title of tonight's program and so forth. You have a take on it that I had not heard before, please. Mm. Well, um, I, I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri, and uh, I have a white mother um, and a biologically black dad. And so I, for a long time, I called myself biracial, um, but it created this sort of uh, dissonance and tension in within myself. Um, thinking about myself almost as two separate species and, so, and co-existing. Um, and of course the word race was a construct. It was a, it's a, it's a word that was created by people who were trying to justify their mistreatment and oppression of others. And um, so whereas the word racism is a completely real thing because it is based on this false construct of race. So I don't use the word when I speak about myself and I, how I identify myself, I always say of mixed heritage or I'm just mixed. Um, but yes, the word race itself uh, is, yeah, it's just triggering. So when one, when one speaks of racial unrest that's already capitulating to the myth, to the to the problem in the first place well be, i for me yes because it is suggesting that the the word itself segregates people and buying into this idea that we are not all, i mean the, biologically the word that race is not it's not founded in anything so um for us to genuinely uh, feel that we are one human group who, who definitely has different cultures, which we can celebrate. We have different heritages, which we can celebrate. But mm. um, yeah, that's just my... Anthony, one of the questions we talked about yesterday, I'm, I'm, and I think it's very important for our public who may be coming to this rather complex and sensitive subject for the first time, it's so straight on, and especially for musicians in a musical context. But when you were growing up, and, and I'm, I'm, I hesitate with these questions, Latoya, because I already hear myself saying things that I really, I don't believe, but I, 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 you hear them all the time, and they aggravate me so much. I mean, if you grew up as an American, boom, full stop. But there's always that qualifier. What, what, was, what it was like growing up as a black American? What Were you always aware of being 
black, but although you're in America, as if being black is something separate than the entity of being American. Do you, do you understand what I mean by the question? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I can it? just, I'll just try to talk generally about that. I'll try to Please. sift through that because we don't have a couple, a few hours or a lifetime. Oh, no, um, this is serious. We're going to do this but, every day for the week. Yeah. <laughs> but I think what I'll say about that is that when I was growing up, I actually spent a lot of my childhood. Um, and actually, you know what? I spend my existence not really focused on that construct that you were, right. you were just, Julia was just talking about. I don't walk around th thinking about that in particular on a daily basis. Only I have thoughts that are based on my knowledge of what it means to be that, if that makes sense. So what I mean is that, especially when I was a child, you spend the most of your childhood as a, as a human, right? As a human child, a human boy. And the only thing I knew about race was, and, and people's thoughts about my particular race was the education I received from my parents. And mm -hmm. my, my dad grew up in Mississippi in the deep South. And he grew up in, and the talk that he had about it where there were two, two concepts of this. One is that he, of pride, Pride coming from um, my parents' view that they and their pride of themselves and, and their pride of, of who they are and where they're from gave them a sense of pride to pass down to me. So that was their number one responsibility. And mm. so my dad would talk about his town being the first all black chartered town in America, meaning that they went to town and they were saying, this, we have a town. And which was, it sounds ridiculous, but it wasn't allowed to happen. Okay. And so these are people that were enslaved and that then created their place in society. And so he was proud of that fact, but also not proud of the fact that he had to sit in a separate balcony. He had to sit in the balcony in movie theater in the South. He had to drink from separate water fountains. He grew up in the segregated South and spent eight eight years um, of that before he moved to Chicago. So these stories are where I got the concept of what that was. These okay. stories, this education of what that meant to him, what it meant in dealing with the world outside of our home, mm -hmm. and how I didn't have to change, that I could be proud of who I was and who I am, but others in the world may see me as the other or see me as different, but that wasn't to change my own pride. That's what I was taught at home. So it's, it's a very interesting, powerful thing to have to, to um, think about when you're a child. But the pride part of my family was the most important thing. It, mm. wasn't, it wasn't the external constructs or external thoughts about what others think of you. It's what you think of you. And in our house, I was human. I was a human boy. I was a McGill boy, right? So it's important to, to kind of distinguish that. Well, I mean, regardless of the particular tensions today or, or the acuteness of, of, this, of this obscenity that won't, that won't go away, that sounds to me like one of the healthiest ways to raise a child, regardless of their cultural background or race, if you will. I mean that's a that's a beautiful that's a beautiful story, but I suspect in the American context, and and we talked about this, and either one of you just jump in there. There is inevitably this feeling, and I, I don't want to get to how music and your musical studies perhaps ameliorated this, but there's nevertheless this construct of your identity and and who you are and and your and your pride in yourself and your family and your cultural heritage, and you are an American, but that is an, another tent under which you live. It's not, it's not, quite frankly, like probably somebody like me from Spokane, Washington, which said, oh yeah, I grew up in America, I grew up in the South, I grew up in the Northwest, and my dad was a hoodoo hoodoo, and I yada, and I never come from this, and we don't even think about it. I don't have, an, I don't have another identity or another, or another hook 
another, you know, it doesn't matter that my folks come from Missouri. It doesn't matter if my mother comes from Ozarks. It doesn't matter that my grandmother came from Wales. You know, that kind of, th all that stuff is just interesting. But there is this, there's this other, there's this other intact exception. I mean, do, do you see what I'm trying to drive at? And is that something you've always been aware of, the both of you? Julia, you write very eloquently about your father and, and him taking you to, to civil rights movements and meetings, or you experienced some of those, and or he was very involved in that. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm, there must have been something in your childhood that I'm trying, I'm struggling with the questions. It's okay. There, it's must okay. Been, there must have been times in your childhood where you were clearly being educated, informed, nurtured, cared for in a reality that may very well bump up against where you live. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I would say um, I was just dealing with it all the time. And that's because I was growing up in a very segregated community in St. Louis, Webster Groves. Mm -hmm. um, there were railroad tracks. My family lived right alongside the railroad tracks. One side was the historically black, predominantly black community that still is present today. Mm -hmm. And then on the other side, then the South side was the white community. And so it was on my mind all the time. Now, when it came to music, um, I, and the arts actually, I was, I really wasn't thinking about my identity so much, certainly not as a young person uh or my identity in in terms of how people were viewing me um but when i started studying classical music it became very conscious in my mind um one because there weren't weren't a lot of uh black people around who at least in, in my midst who were in involved in classical music and I was introduced to classical music all through white people including my stepfather but mm -hmm. um, uh, going to music school in like my first week I was compared to Josephine Baker and you know I, I was at that time really unable to look at my unable and unwilling in fact to look at my identity because it was so painful to even consider but because of the comparison to this very popular entertainer who did not sing classical music, but had a, a lovely light lyrical voice, you know, it is what, that is what drove me into all of the research that I was started to do. And all of the then healing and understanding that I was, I had to do um, in order to get at the, well, unlock, actually just unlock and break the ideas that I had had about myself um, that even I, yeah, I just hadn't been able to face up until that point. Did you feel people wanted you to be like Josephine Baker? Oh, that. Well, I think oh, also, I mean, young. I mean, we still hear this all the time. I hear it from young singers today. Your voice is so colorful. It's so rich. You know, you have that black sound. You have that black sound, and I did not. I was so. Um, indoctrinated with the idea even just of being considered black in St. Louis was such a negative thing. I had such a negative association with it. I didn't want anyone associating my voice with blackness in any way. And I'm so grateful, honestly, I'm so grateful to the classical music world <laughs> and to my teacher and through the act of singing that I was able to reconcile the uh, I hate, to say, I hate to say nonsense of that. It's like there's, when you talk about mm. pride, Anthony, it's like, yeah, mm. like I, to actually make pride, feel pride and peace with my blackness. Like that was a huge major thing. Um, and all that that encompassed. But I Is actually, I felt most comfortable doing that on stage, addressing that on stage and through music. Mm. I could not talk about it. It took me so years and years to be able to talk about it. So as your as your students and you're coming into the classical music scene, both of you, and you're studying literature of incredible dead white people <laughs> uh, of the 19, 18th and 19th century, I, 
I, I know you well enough and respect you well enough, but I need to ask the stupid question. Was there a time where you were felt you were playing somebody else's music, as it were, or somebody else, somebody, some, some other racial source, or did you just feel like you were playing music that belonged to humanity? Oh, I mean, I guess I can, I can go there because um, when I, I never, I never thought about it. I mean, I think when you're young, the majority is the majority. Like, how should I say, society, well, society is white. Well, so I actually speaking of identity and how you relate to that is that that's just that's just with everything. Oh. So and I grew up in a predominantly black neighborhood on the south side of Chicago, but um, generally speaking, like the the it was ob it's obvious that the world is white. <laughs> so that's not that's not something like I you know when I'm picking up the clarinet and playing music on the page by Josh Dukovich or whatever or not Shasta Govich as a kid, but you know, somebody, Mozart, did it come across my mind that he was white? No, because that assumption the, the we live in a white world. Whiteness, basically, or white, yes. Of, of whiteness. whiteness. So, yes. so yeah. whiteness in its sense is actually not like the other. It is the thing that you know is, is, is the, the, the way the world is, is, is viewed. So, um, I didn't actually make any judgments on that when I was a when I was a child. I think it was only when I, um, after years of playing as a professional musician, that I think I started to see the concept being what it is is what you describe, which is um, wait how come there are no um, people of color or female or whatever composers on these programs? How come we never play? this or when there is a concert it's just a special concert when you invite somebody of color to do it and that's when it becomes more of like this um uh like this this all-encompassing thing that people can't get out of mm -hmm. and that's the people that are actually running the thing that you're a part of so that's a different level but when you're when i was younger and playing clarinet and learning how to play the clarinet i didn't think of it in that way because lots of things were that way when you when you go downtown and you go to youth orchestra yes the whole orchestra is basically white and i understood that but that was like also as a black kid on the south side of chicago that was very all that stuff was very obvious to me it was very <laughs> very obvious did you feel either one of you that you had to be a little just a notch better at what you did to be taken seriously because you weren't white I, I think I was taught that I had to be, yeah, I had to, I had to achieve, like, I had to be, want to be number one. I had to want to be the best, um, just growing up, period, you know, to survive, to actually get, because to get up, for, get, for instance, to get out of uh, poverty, to get out of, um, that my parents had to do, they had to do that in a society that was also, um, even more segregated than the society I grew up in. And the society I grew up in was very segregated too. We also had train tracks in Chicago that I was on the other side of on the South side um, after um, you know, uh, redlining and, and, and people in America know what that means, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> like, and um, you know, so we also knew what that was you know, there, but yeah, we I had to be, we had to work hard. We had to work harder than everyone. We had to, we, I felt that I was taught that, that I needed to, I needed to always do my best. And I could never say can't in my house. Yeah. I could never say can't. I don't know if it was ever brought up as like, in order to do well, you have to do better than all the white people you see around you. That was never phrased in that way. It, but okay. I did somehow internalize that I had to be exceptional and extraordinary at whatever it was that I was pursuing. I don't even know if that was my parents, though. I, honestly, I don't. I. I don't know if they were actually the ones who, who, who convinced me of that mindset. Um, uh, yeah, no, I'm just. I'm trying to think through it. When you were. Um. When you. Uh... Cutting to cutting to 
to the, the, the events of this last 10 days and Mr. Floyd's murder. Uh, and unfortunately, in a, in a long line of murders in recent history, and, and not in any way divorced from the murderous past that is simply part of the DNA of America, which so many incredibly enlightened people, both white and black and other nationalities, are trying to encourage that we embrace. I'm, I'm reading this book, I forgot to look at the others, called Democracy in Black. But the point is, if we don't own our heritage, if we don't own the sins of our past, we can't move forward. And, and we keep feeling, seemingly slamming ourselves up against the wall with this intermittent outbreaks of murder and abuse and the statistics for existence as an African-American in America is pretty awful. Uh, so, I mean, there's a lot of statistical evidence, but what you are now describing, the two of you, is, is, is motivational, inspirational ideas about how one as a human being simply should move forward and, and embrace. And you found a lot of that, a lot of that goaling and a lot of that uh, focus in, in your work as musicians, in the arts. Is there something in the arts in general, even if you don't want to be a, a, a musician or a professional, that, that belongs in our curriculum? Does it belongs as, a, as, an inf, as some kind of detente for our young people to understand that life is life, humans are humans, and perhaps different cultures are prisms through which we see how things human happen? Yeah, I think if there were, yeah, that, I'm like, man, you, you're, you're asking some really great ones here. <laughs> There's so much depth here. And I'll try to like uh, do a, a short answer to all of that. But I think this prism you speak of, that it actually is very important. Because if kids are exposed to art, just generally, as kids, art, meaning uh, uh, what it is, which is diverse, and different and varied and colorful and lacking of color. And it comes from different places all over the world. It's global. Music is like that too. And if a child were to learn about all of these things as, as a child and the different connections between all of the parts of the world that have created all of this, all of these great pieces of art and these great pieces of music, then I may be idealistic, but I could imagine that that child's brain would be more accepting of the beauty of all mankind, mm -hmm. all of humankind. But like I said, that's um, a little idealistic, but I would well, I hope I would hope that's the case. I would hope that's the case. Yeah, I don't know if it is, Anthony. I mean, just speaking of how, how we're this prism and where everything, we even just where an artistic work comes from, kids love stories, right? It's like, and I think one thing that is problematic is when we, when we talk about music education or art education, visual art, whatever, it's done sometimes like pulling out the individuals who have created the work. Mm -hmm. They don't know the stories of the people who are making the work mm -hmm. and, and making a personal connection with those, with the work, yes, the work can and should hopefully speak for itself. But the creation of that work came from some real life experience, usually something quite intense quite personal very that was impactful so i i i do think if we are as we're thinking about arts education telling the history talking about like owning your history if we're informing and sharing the diverse history individual histories also it's like you can hear even just listening between anthony and i like how we are we nod at each other's stories, but they are they they are individual, right? They are unique. So um I, I and, and that way I I it is about how the 
how the material is delivered, how it is contextualized. And to I, add, you know, to add just sorry, jumping you know, in, just to, just jumping please. in to add, you said something really important about that, which is that we don't, at least I didn't learn about all of the different histories. And a lot of a lot of times you don't learn about your own. If we're trying to divide, if we're going to divide humankind into races. You don't learn about unless you learn it from home, a lot of times about people with dark faces and their creation in the world. It's mm -hmm. left out of the actual history books that a lot of children learn. The struggle is left in, sorry. Yeah, the struggle is left mm -hmm. in. The Civil rights class, but in, and even, in. yeah. And not the creation and all of the heroes of mankind that have created things. That's kind of left out. That's like, oh, well, that didn't really happen or something. And so as you get older, you learn about these things. You're like, wow, how come I didn't know about that until I was 35? You know, how come I didn't know about that person until I was 40? Like, hey, what a hero, hey, what a journey. Mind. Yeah, what a journey that person made. And how, if I would known about that as a child, um, that would have given me just one more role model, you know? And it's just amazing to think about. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I love the title. I love the Julie, I want to tell you, I love the title of your of your essay because you're the artist in residence at the Met Museum. Is that has oh, that been put on hold year. because of last year? Was last it last year. year? Yeah. Okay, so it's sitting up there, but history's persistent voice. That's it. That's it. I'm I'm gonna steal that. I'm, I'll give you credit for it, but it's absolutely a it's it's like voices across time or all of these sorts of things. And and you mentioned earlier story and the impact of story i i see so much of what we do as as classical artists as simply the conveyor of different stories i don't think of schubert as a white boy i think of certainly think of him as as a young man living under unimaginable political oppression talk about being afraid of your life and yet not rising to that occasion what schubert's drive was was to find as many poets from as many places to give him some inspiration, to give a musical language to what it means to be alive and be human. And that's why the miracle of his different styles and the miracle of always finding the right voice for this or that poet, musical voice is, is so extraordinary, but it, has, it, it transcends the particulars in a way. The question is whether can, and I'm not, when you use the word like transcend, it, it feels like, you know, oh yeah, we've dealt with that. We've taken care of that, and 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 I and, and I, I I'm I'm deeply impacted this week, even emotionally, um, by Wynton Marsalis's essay that he graciously put on Facebook and has now caught some traffic. I I admire this man uh, passionately. I'm 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 incredibly honored to call him a friend. Um, but he's written some very very prescient things about about that, and and that. And that we live in a time, it, we can't keep saying, you know, we're done with the race. Oh, we've solved that. We, we're, we've moved on. We're now the non-racial party or whatever Reagan came up with or whatever, all these political adages on. Clearly, we haven't. We've never, you know, and, and you both have eloquently uh, quoted Brian Stevenson, who is one of the most enlightened leaders of, of, of justice in our in our country and and you both have spoken of hope I, I let me quote him which you it's on i don't know which one of you i'm just going right to the middle of what he says about being hopeful hopefulness has to be the approach we take so i am hopeful just because hopelessness is the enemy of justice once you become hopeless you become a prisoner of the conditions that have created so much conflict so when i mean about transcending it's it has to be about something bigger than the bullshit of racism about the abuse and the 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 aggression of human beings the hate that is there we we must be as artists always holding something up that says there is hope because it's something you can believe in does that make sense yeah i guess i'll just say i think though any I will admit I've had a few, I will just say, transcendent moments in my life. 
but they've come because I have been hyper aware and conscious. It's like they were brought, they came, those moments come with thought, with information. And that's like, an, it's a, it, you're activating and enlightening, making, making connections and seeing things super more clearly. So it is not, yeah, you, as you, transcendence, it is not abandoning or trying to just blindly mm. say, you know, at some point, I'll find a moment of illumination. No, you really have to work hard for that. You really have to. Sorry. That's, see, there. <laughs> you really Sorry, to... I'm just trying to charge in my computer so it doesn't cut off on us. On this that would be sad, sad news. That would be sad news. I thought like you, you were doing the dishes. I, I uh, <laughs> so, but like, forgive me. Anyway, no, but like those moments, they come and they go. Like that's the, that's the deal and, and I, so I, um, I guess why I, why I love art so much is because it is not about distraction. It is not about displacement. It is not, it is like the most engaging, most enriching, most entrenched thing that I can possibly do for myself, to myself and with others. Wow, that's amazing. So like, um, Please. Can, can I read going. another quote? Yeah. I, I, I love, I, I love yeah. you. Really. I, I got another. I want to read another quote. I don't know much about Thornton Dial, so I want you to tell me after this. But I love this. I absolutely love this, and and it gets to the point that you know artists are all about questions and mirrors, and the answers are up to each individual. Isn't that the point of democracy? But never mind. Art is strange-looking stuff, and most people don't understand art. If everybody understand one another wouldn't nobody make art art is something to open your eyes art is for understanding that is so beautiful tell me about this person tell us about this person so Thornton Dahl, the you talk about the the title of the um the program history's persistent voice and actually i have to, I have to credit that to be more tomer she's she runs the met uh museum the live arts um program right. Um, but it was based on this exhibition uh, that was after a multimedia work that was uh, um, created by Thornton Dial. Uh, he's a visual artist um, called History Refused to Die. And it's this massive, I mean, I'd say it's like five, seven by, I'm, I'm now I'm just going to get all the, the dimensions wrong. So I'm not going to get dimensions. It's a big, it's a wall. Okay. It's a wall and it's deep also. Um, um, and the, he grew up in the South in a community though of artists who were considered for a very long time and also marketed this way as being other, as being outsiders. Their art was called outsider art um, because they did not go to a, an approved art school, but people still, like their work still resonated right their work was it was it still worked and they had a, it was a school there wasn't i mean they they all had mentors they all knew of each other so um and thornton dial was kind of the, the first the older man in this amongst this group of, of visual artists um and yeah one among many but he spoke he speaks so it was like such sage words about art and life and how they're interconnected um, as many of these visual artists did. Oh my God, I wish I, everyone would just go, go and re read the, these transcribed interviews um, of, of these visual artists. Um, but that, that is who he is. And that, that's, that is, I think is what he's talking about. This, this, but this uh, interconnectedness between life and, and art. The integration and in art and art as a, as a, mitigator if you were and 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 the artistic evidence that we call the arts is really evidence of footpaths of people that come before us and we should learn from them and so forth but th this element this element of of storytelling grabs me and i and i go back to julia I'm picking her because we're singers but i mean 
how you can how you have brilliantly had a recital that had Schubert on the front end and Nina Simone on the back end, I think is just beautiful. So there must have been subterranean stories about humanness that you found in various musical poetic contexts that was more important than fitting the equation of, oh, no, you can't do that. You can't sing that on that and that and that. Is it, am, I, am I guessing cor correctly? Am I getting close? Sure, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it... Um, I mean, we white folks know Nina Simone is the really angry black woman. You know, so, jazz some, woman. I'm, and, some I'm sure and, do you hear that, right? Yeah. And said, you know, God damn this, and God, oh my God, it's just terrible. Right? Uh, yeah, no, that, I, I know, I'm sure that is a view of, of some white people, for sure. Um, I mean, I... I wanted to talk about in this in this program women writers, I guess. And on, honestly, when we think a lot about blues singers, jazz singers, we don't talk about them as what about the work that they compose themselves. And so, in this recital, um, I opened with some Schubert songs. Didn't say anything about them other than the last one. But the first song in that program, the original poem, was not accredited to the woman who wrote it. And so mm -hmm. when I opened this group, the last group that featured blues and jazz writers and um, composers, um, I brought it up. I just made a point of that. And while then also exploring this repertoire that I feel is ge like genuinely classic repertoire. And when I say classic, it's just stuff that I want mm -hmm. to sing repeatedly and it's material I want to return to repeatedly and I learn something from every time I go back to it. So um, that 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 is but that's based on the, the content, right? It's like and that's based on me also me no longer like rigidly saying here is a genre, here is a people, here is a um, uh, here is a woman, here is it's like I just uh, it's just not. I, I'm. I'm not in that headspace anymore. The title don't has, need, to, don't need, has to. Be about, yeah, has yeah. to be about life. Right, and it's like I don't need to be. I'm not in a uh, segregated, like mental mm. space anymore when I think about music. And I think honestly, I just never was. So for for some reason, through music programming, it's like it is so fun to explicitly bring attention to that and exploit it. I will just say, I'll, I, I do like to exploit that. Can I ask a really lethal question? Do you guys think in your generation and in America, in various organizations, and probably Anthony, you can treat this or talk to this more. Do you think that there would be more, do you think there would be more musicians of color in orchestras and soloists and whatever, if we had less racism, do you think that is a contributing factor? Is is classical music too white? <laughs> <laughs> is classical uh, music too white? Is that your question? <laughs> no, my is question it, is whether <laughs> I'm not <laughs> asking. I'm not answering that question. But, hey. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just had to repeat you back to yourself. <laughs> one second. <laughs> yeah, he just said that. that. He just Look, said the, that. The, the, the question, the question is, the question is, that's why I said it's a legal question. It's a volatile question. Do, do you, do you think there is a, the, there is a la layer of racism in our musical community in America that is prohibiting an even more integrated exploration, the celebration of American talent, regardless of color? How about that for a better question? Well, I would say, I mean you know, like as a general answer, like I said, it's it's complex, but I would say racism is contributes to there being a dearth of people of color in orchestras. So oftentimes when you say that people think, they think you're talking about racism as in, do the people in the orchestras that hire people or within the organization, do they hate people of color? Like that's usually what that is. Like, are they racists? That's mm. a racist person. Have you? But that's have that's you not that. Well, um, I've encountered. Have, some, I've encountered. Been... I've encountered some of that. You know, but more most importantly, when we say that um, there is uh, racism contributing to the dearth of that, 
that exists as a a thing that is structural and is um is built into kind of society so racism is not something that you can point to and say it's just that it's it's literally like okay well um when uh white people moved out of the inner cities of like let's say chicago and moved to the suburbs mainly when black people started moving up from the south mississippi and memphis and these places into these neighborhoods that with that they took a lot of the resources out of those neighborhoods and people that were um, barely able to get loans because they really weren't able to get that many loans during this period and moved into these neighborhoods black people predominantly and the tax revenue the dollars that went into um, the public school systems in those areas went way down because of racism mm. and especially in those years racist attitudes that the students that were studying in the schools when they took music out of the school took classical music out of the schools mm -hmm. because of lack of funding in the city of chicago or whatever mm -hmm. then all of those kids that it just used to be a given that kids would get music education in school right mm -hmm. it was not a given when especially when you know i was a child and the all of the arts and everything came out of the school system so my parents had to actively find ways to to sacrifice and find the places that were giving opportunity to the kids on the south side of Chicago, the inner city kids right when it used to be something that was just taken for granted of course you would get music in the school and so that concept and that that barrier to entry for just an artistic well well-rounded education is just one little drop in a sea of cause and effects that create a barrier to entry into the wider world the wider society of success and prosperity for so many people so well, that's why it's not so simple um to say oh yeah you know um, you can yeah, and, and just even like uh, with music education, when we're talking about classical Western art and that mm -hmm. training, that requires literacy, that requires you to be able to read, that requires you to be able to write, and right. if and to read uh, transcriptions, to be able to interpret poetry, it's like. If that, if there is a a poor literacy rate and a, I mean, just just education in language um, and reading, so how fundamental. But if that is not addressed because of the constructs of racism mm. that have now now we are seeing, we have seen the. Um, I mean, generation after generation of uh, illiterate people. And mm. for the classical music world, it is a kind of, it is a requirement. I would say it is a requirement. It seems pretty difficult to, um, to separate this exactly very prescient and wonderful perceptive conversation we're having about, uh, about the, the dismantling of the great liberal arts uh, tradition, education tradition in America, which is a kind of cultural suicide, has been my passion for my whole career. Um, but it's very difficult to have that conversation and, and not actually get into income inequality. Because a lot of stuff that we talk, we're calling racism, we're actually talking about no opportunity because the dead end of money. The minute that Reagan defined the arts as the extracurricular that those people that are interested, should, interested in it should invest and make it possible, ergo take it out of the government and it's no responsibility to have any kind of general attitude of education that the arts and humanities are actually the glue of the various disciplines and so forth. We were on a very, very fast bobsled to hell. And and I, I do think that that's a very contributing factor to, to the things we keep seeing manifest today. And we Absolutely. don't live in a very, a very supporting atmosphere. I want to read something that you wrote uh, 
or it was written about you, Anthony. He challenges fellow musicians and Americans to shine a light on racism. Sorry about the word, Julia. In no, racism is, is real. <laughs> racism is real. Using, <laughs> using hashtag, hashtag take two knees, which he says is a tribute to Colin Kaepernick's kneeling protests of police violence. Here's where I want to go. We should be using those to express what's wrong so we can make help it right. Nonviolence, that is also what I believe in, and you were just quoting Martin Luther King uh, in that. But here's the big, big sentence, in my opinion, Anthony. But, says you, we always look at the perpetrator. We never look at the problem. God bless you for that. I mean, yeah, wow. Yeah, yeah. well, we were, we were, um, uh, I'll try to hold it together, but that actually came from this interview that just was released today in NPR with Tom Huizenga. And we were talking about this two days ago. And that was in the midst of us kind of taking our breaths from because of tears in our conversation, in our interview. And, and uh, he got my words r really right. Because he's a very smart guy, and I appreciate you giving him credit for this. And, and of course, that's what I'm reading from. And it's a, it's a wonderful interview, and it, it's on NPR, right? Yes. Yes, everyone, yeah. every, everyone, everyone should should see it. You said some other wonderful things, guys. We're getting a little bit of, uh, towards our time, and and they'll probably start yanking me out. I want to read you a, a, a paragraph. Uh, there's several paragraphs of Winton's uh, essay. Uh, that I could read. And the, this one I want to read because it makes me particularly sad because I want to, I want to, I want to throw my arms around Winton and I don't give a damn about the virus <laughs> and say, no, 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 don't do that. We need you too much. But this is how far it seems we have gone. And it seems that, that we are in a kind of tipping point. Uh, in our culture in America. I, I hope I hope with Mr. Stevenson that he's right. I, I fear with Mr. Wa Ma Winton Marsalis that he's wrong. Winton writes, in each of the four decades of my adult life, I have addressed our myriad American social and character problems with an involved peace that always defends a belief in the progression towards freedom and that my parents taught us was perhaps possible for all. Experientially, artistically, and spiritually, I've, I've had a lifetime relationship akin to obsession with confronting this national calamity and conundrum. As these decades have passed and our nation has retreated from the promises of the civil rights movement that my generation grew up believing would substantially improve economic and social opportunities for those who had been denied by our quote unquote traditions, I have spoken, written, played and composed about the toll that American racial injustice has taken on all of us, our possibilities, our presence and our promise. Those words, notes and more seem to have been wasted on gigs, recordings, in classrooms, in prisons, in prisons, in parks, on TV shows, in print, on radio, and from almost any podium from the deep hood to palatial penthouse in cities, towns, and suburbs in every state and region of our country day and night, and sometimes deep into the night for over 40 relentless years. Call him. It's not in vain. It, it can't be in vain. We, we, can't, we can't give up hope. And we can't ever let the arts be relegated to distraction or the high end of the entertainment industry. This crisis is, is going to help us redefine the very need and use of arts in our society, it seems to me, from the get-go, because the, 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 the business models and even physical models of how we share artistic experiences human to human are, are going through dramatic change. We're never going back. We're mutating into something else. And I think there's a wonderful lot of wonderful possibilities uh, about that. But, you know, Wynn and I are the same age. And that paragraph just impacted me like a, like a, like a gut blow. 
to to feel like you know and he names he names recordings and later in the paragraph we see he he goes through the obscenities of the time and they're from the words of abraham lincoln as if he had to come out of the grave says winton to remind us all where are we at guys what can we do one as human beings and two as artists what can we do i appreciate your conversation we've we've gone around it you guys want to close up with some hope <laughs> Are well, people listening? Well, I well, I I talked about this in that that interview a little bit, but sometimes it's hard to find hope alone. Hmm. Actually, I didn't talk about that. What I just said in that interview, yeah. but I talked about this. But sometimes hope has to come not only from within, but sometimes hope has to come from our community. Sometimes hope has to come from our our people, if you will. And that hope has to, can unite us, but not only that, more importantly, I think at the darkest, well, the deepest times that we lose, we lose our hope, right? It falls out. We have, I feel like we have to rely on each other for that sense of hope. You know, when I, when I saw those people do their tributes online or and when I or when I saw Julia, your your beautiful, beautiful was it brown girl? Brown baby, yeah. Rendition, brown baby. So I there are two, a couple things that happen. One, I cry. But two, I realize that there is power and there is pride and there is hope in that art. So I just know that on a personal level, I, I've always gotten my personal inspiration from music, from art, but I do feel like we cannot forget that we can reach people. And I just, I do hope that when we reach people, they will see and listen, they, they will listen to us. They will listen to us when we tell them we're hurting you know, that you will hear Winton in Winton's words, that how is Winton Marcellus, the, the, one of the greatest musicians that has ever walked the face of the earth and artists, how is he saying these words and why? The why is really important. And if we have something to do with that, changing what that is, what that why is, I don't think we should give up. I think if all of the artists all uh, throughout all of time have would have given up on creating art and given up on that pursuit of something greater, something better, we wouldn't have the greatness of all of history, the great, the great works of art that we wouldn't have any of it. And we feel as though our time is the worst time. We feel as though our time is the, the worst time on earth ever, but there have been worse times. Mm. And there will be probably more. Worse and there times. may be. It's, yeah. I mean, I think mean, about my, an, my ancestors who made it here on a boat shackled in a, a dark ship. Perhaps they had it worse. You think? There were people that gave up hope that ended up off the ship. And so we have a responsibility, I believe, to our ancestors, to the people that we believe in, that, that we trust in our community, to not give up and to support them and to hug them and give them some sort of direction and lift when they need it most. That's what we're asking for. Julia, any more thoughts? Are you just kind of, you, you look un wonderfully reflective. I am, I, I think I am just reflecting right now. I'm having a any thoughts? Yeah, I have many. Um, I just, I guess I'm not ready to make any sort of statement yet about where we need to be. And in and, and part, it's because I guess I've sort of, because I've had to my whole life navigate white spaces and whiteness and educate myself in it. Um, in order to survive it. Um, I'm just feeling, I, 
I'm not quite sure what else it is that I need to say or how I need to say it to have it resonate. Like I'm not sure yet. And I think it will come in maybe some methods of in the processes as, as we're all, anyway, I, I'm, I'm, I have I have not a lot like just comprehensively. Just to do say. what you do. Just do what you do. Yeah, yeah, and I, I mean that's exactly okay. it. Exactly. That's people, exactly it. Are, that you're okay. Yeah, you can't right. do anything else. We're that's fine. right. What, what else yeah. can we do as artists except make audible the great thoughts and evidences of life in various contexts gone by to enlighten? or give a pause to a certain presence so that there is a reflection of a possible future. I mean, what else do we do? That's what we do. And we don't have answers. We have some good questions. We observation. We do we do we do offer by by being the audible evidences of great artistic thought. We do offer hope to any individual that opens their mind and their heart to look for a a longer horizon, it seems to me, and a more fulfilling life. We have to get out of this more brown, small existence and get back to living big and open and curious. It seems to me, you guys are great. You're the you're the most wonderful evidence of the now generation. I'm just anything I can ever possibly do to just. I just want to blow on your back and be a wind in your sails, whatever. You guys are, you're just wonderful. It's been a wonderful discussion. I deeply appreciate your your candidness and your honesty. And I love your music making. Everybody, go on iDodge, look for these two people, wherever they are, go. Yeah, both of you, by the way, oh, I, you know, the whole time you were talking, Julia, uh, by the way, you know, iDodge is the place where music, classical music happens. There is so much happening right now, ladies and gentlemen, about the platforms of streaming and digital access. And one of the great new uh, uh, platforms is the digital, is the, is the global concert hall on iDodge Live, in which I hope you will be able to experience these wonderful artists wherever they are. It just becomes a digital phenomenon. That's going to be certainly a third rail of classical music uh, for the foreseeable immediate future, where we will have the hybrid of some limited personal public, but hopefully a digital production that is as much about the digital public as the physical public. And I think that is why it's a third rail. And I think it's a very exciting development that I'm really trying to be as part of as, as I can. Julia, your project at the museum that you said is now going on a little bit on tour in different places. Mm -hmm. You know, I, let's have a conversation about how we get this teched up as an event that can be on our Dodger uh, Global Concert Hall. And and Anthony, please promise me your trio's coming on tour to, to Europe. <laughs> <laughs> I will let you know. <laughs> All right, exactly. Thank you for you amplifying our voices, really. I, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Guys are great. It's been a wonderful evening. Ladies and gentlemen, we didn't do any iDodger platform screen sharing, but I think we all should have a glass of water and a quiet moment and think about all these wonderful, wonderful thoughts and know that, you know, C.S. Lewis said, we read to know we're not alone. We make music to establish radar contact. Good night. <laughs>